Where should I sit? Where am I supposed to sit? Oh, is it on? It's, it's, it's off, though. Oh, no. Can you hear me? Okay. Um, my name is Paddy Dalai. I have the good fortune to direct the International and Comparative Legal Studies program here at the law school. And I want to welcome um, all of you here today on behalf of WCL and American University and uh, want to welcome our distinguished guest, uh, Dr. Kim. Um, our law school is... Um, has one of the oldest international law programs in the country. And we do consider ourselves to have a very much of a global outlook. We count amongst our alums, many distinguished uh, people who work at the World Bank, and we are very proud of our collaboration. This is not the first time we are work welcoming Dr. Kim to our law school. We had the good fortune to have him here during the opening ceremonies of this building. Um, I have a few comments to make in terms of the process. Uh, Dr. Kim will be making um, the, his first remarks, um, and then he will be followed with a Q&A session, which will be moderated by Joshua Johnson, the host of the NPR show 1A. Uh, the event is being uh, live streamed on the World Bank website, and also hashtag for the event is hashtag Jim Kim AU. Um, following this, there is going to be a reception at the Founders Lobby just outside Grossman Hall. Dr. Co Dr. Kim has specifically requested that I don't introduce him. He said, I'm just a regular guy. Don't take too much time of introducing me. Um, so I will only say that he is the 12th president of the World Bank Group, and it's our pleasure to have him here today. I just one point of uh, uh, housekeeping. Please make sure that your cell phones are either turned off or on uh, vibrate. Thank you very much, Dr. Kim. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Padide. Can I just ask, uh, do we have high school students here? Oh my goodness. The most difficult audience in the world, high school students. Uh, so um, let me start by can, you, can everyone hear? I think I, I hear a little echo. Is that maybe down a little bit? Is that, is that okay still? Okay. So let, let's start with a little history. I, I have a degree in anthropology, and I used to teach the introductory anthropology course uh, when I was a graduate student. And you, you, you guys probably, these are the cave paintings of Lascaux. But the reason I bring it up is because something very different happened over the last uh, 200 years that had never happened before in history. Before 1800, just about everybody was poor. You had royalty, you had these huge landowners, but they were a tiny, tiny minority, and just about everyone lived in poverty, and everyone lived very much uh, wedded to their land. Uh, the, this, was, this was the entire history of, uh, of humanity. Uh, there were some huge changes, of course, agriculture. What happened was that mostly people were hunters and gatherers uh, before agriculture. And then when agriculture started, uh, food production was then uh, brought to people rather than vice versa. People didn't go out looking for food. There were places where they, could, uh, they, they knew uh, that a steady supply of food would be created. Uh, but wealth was tied to land. And those who controlled land uh, controlled much of the world's wealth. And the difficulty was in shipping or moving anything. Things, ideas, people, it was very difficult to move anything, so there wasn't uh, very much trade. And so the cost of moving things really mattered and shaped the way uh, societies uh, uh, were, were formed. In the 17th century, only 3,000 European ships uh, sailed to Asia. In the 18th century, for the next uh, 100 years, about 6,000 ships sailed. It was very difficult to move anything. Now, uh, around 1800, 1820, uh, some very important things happened. And the, most, the two most important ones that most historians will look at are the Industrial Revolution and steam power. 
So around 1820, steam power allowed the movement of goods. And the movement of goods fueled industrialization, trade, and economic growth. Uh, but uh, at that time also uh, was the start of uh, one of the great uh, economists, Deirdre McCloskey, uh, talked about uh, right around that time, with the advent of the Industrial Revolution and steam, you had the beginning of what she called the Great Divergence, meaning that certain areas, especially Europe and the United States, grew rich very, very quickly. Uh, she talks about the founding, uh, the, the formation of the so-called bourgeoisie. And the bourgeoisie were former peasants who were close enough to royalty that they wanted to live like that. And so uh, she sees the development of the bourgeoisie as a very important development because they were the precursors of the middle class. Now, in the two centuries from 1820 until now, uh, what happened was that the uh, availability of goods, of services, just exploded. It wasn't, it wasn't uh, uh, a little bit of change. It was just huge amounts of change. Because before 1820, people were born and they died in pretty much the same world. The world from the time they were born to the time they died didn't change very much. But starting in 1820, the world started changing very, very quickly. Uh, two centuries ago, four out of five US adults uh, worked to grow food for their families. Now, one farmer uh, feeds 300 people. So uh, the reason I talk about this is because we have to put these things in perspective. We have to put the, the, the evolution of sort of human advancement, which is what we work on at the World Bank, development, we have to put it in the perspective of what happened. You know, Chinese President Xi Jinping talks about uh, having thousands of years of, uh, of a great um, success, and, 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 and truly, uh, it was Asia and the Middle East that were the, the sources of much uh, innovation you know, before 1800. And then uh, he often says that the 200 years after 1800 were not so great for China, but of course, China's growing very rapidly now. And, and, and again, before 1800, remember, just about everybody was poor. Now, this is what I see everywhere I go. Everywhere I go, I see young people who may not own a smartphone, but who have access to smartphones. By 2025, many analysts are saying that the entire world will have access to broadband. Now, when you get access to broadband, when you can see things on the internet, a couple of things happen. First of all, people are much more satisfied with their lives when they have internet access. When they have internet access, they can see how the world works. They can watch movies, television shows. The satisfaction with life goes up. But the other thing that happens is their reference income goes up. And this is something that we actually study at the World Bank Group. Uh, the, the, the income to which they compare their own goes up. And when that happens, your income also has to go up or you're not very satisfied. Now, uh, technology is going to do us a great service by getting everyone connected. But the other thing that technology is doing at the same time is it's going to eliminate some jobs. Now, there's, there's a lot of different uh, um, uh, uh, predictions about how many jobs will be lost. Some, some will say that just about all the jobs were lost. Let me, let me just tell you uh, what uh, one person says, this person who I've gotten to know quite well, uh, Jack Ma, who founded the, the great company Alibaba. Right? It's one, it, he's the richest man in China. It's a huge company. Jack Ma puts it this way. He said, you know, when, I, when my grandfather was alive, he worked 16 hours a day, six days a, work, a week, and he felt very busy. He said, me, I work eight hours a day, five days a week, and I feel very busy. My children will work three hours a day, three days a work, and they will feel very busy. Right? <laughs> he says that every single muscle power job will be eliminated by technology. And he goes further, and he says that every single knowledge-based job will be eliminated as well. Maybe not, maybe not as quickly, but it will be eliminated. And he predicts that whenever you have these kinds of ruptures, and he thinks that this is a major rupture, the, the way that artificial intelligence and technology is moving, there's a major rupture. And when that happens, he, his interpretation is that when those things happen, there are at least 30 years of tremendous difficulty and upheaval. And so what do we do? How do we respond to these kinds of upheavals? How do we respond to this, uh, this phenomenon in which everyone knows how everyone else lives, and their aspirations are going up. They want more for themselves, while at the same time, technology uh, potentially could eliminate many, many jobs. Well, 
If you look back into the history of um, uh, how you tackle the problem of inequality, how you tackle the problem of poverty, this man, Andrew Carnegie, is a very important figure. He wrote in a, in a book um, called um, uh, The Gospel of Wealth. He said that the man who dies leaving behind many millions of available wealth, which was his to administer during life, will pass away unwept, unhonored, and unsung. The man who dies thus rich dies disgraced. So Carnegie helped others like John D. Rockefeller think differently about their money. And so philanthropy was started. The word philanthropy entered the English language around the 17th century, translated from the Greek philanthropia, which means love of mankind. Excuse me, let me go back a second. And and, um, uh, British Parliament in 1601 passed the the, uh, Statute of Charitable Uses, the first time when, uh, when governments were supposed to take care of the poor in any given region. Uh, Around the same time, uh, Islamic leaders endowed property to create major educational uh, uh, centers. Shah Abbas, we were just talking uh, with uh, Padita about this, of Persia endowed a school at the Royal Mosque, which set a pattern for similar colleges. And so uh, there there was this tradition of philanthropy. But the point here is that philanthropy, which was our traditional way of thinking about how you um, uh, tackle the problem of inequality and poverty, is not going to work anymore. Let's look at another example. A very famous uh, one, of course, is Albert Schweitzer. Now, I always get in trouble when I talk about Albert Schweitzer like this because people, for good reasons, admire him very much. But Albert Schweitzer was part of a different uh, tradition. He was, he was part of the, the colonialist movement. He was also a missionary. And there was this sense that it was the responsibility of people like Albert Schweitzer to bring civilization to the uncivilized masses. But Albert Schweitzer also portrayed himself as a great physician who was providing care to the poor. Uh, And uh, I first heard about this because there was a cardiologist uh, from the hospital that I trained in in Boston uh, who actually in the 1950s visited Albert Schweitzer. And when he came back, he wrote a little report saying that he was absolutely appalled at the conditions that he found in Albert Schweitzer's hospital. He, he was a cardiologist that specifically looked at uh, rhythm disorders, and he said that so many of the patients there had these things, and there were things to be done for the patients, but they weren't done. A little tiny report, but then it turns out that there was a British journalist named James Cameron who visited, visited Schweitzer in 1953, and here's what he wrote about the hospital that he found. The hospital was a shock. I had been prepared for some unorthodoxies, but not this glaring squalor. The doctor had fenced off all mechanical advance to a degree that seemed both pedantic and appalling. The wards were rude huts, airless and dark, plank beds and wooden pillows, everyone infested with ends and dogs. There was no running water but the rain, no gas, no sewage, no electricity, except, again in character, for the operating theater and the gramophone. Cameron goes on to say, I said then that the hospital existed for him, rather than he for it. It was deliberately archaic and primitive, deliberately part of the jungle around it, a background of his own creation, which clearly meant a great deal more philosophically than it did medically. Now, uh, part of the criticism here is that uh, what Schweitzer was up to, uh, and he talked about it with great clarity. He talked about it. He was an inspiration to many. He talked about his mission to correct the wrongs that others Uh, had instigated in the name of Christianity. But uh, for 30 years, I worked in an organization called Partners in Health, and we tried to do exactly the opposite of what we saw Schweitzer having done. We thought, look, this is not about us. It's about providing the best possible medical care we can out of respect for the fundamental humanity of these others. And so uh, uh, there's so much aspiration, there's so much desire to have access to education, to make sure that your children are not not underfed. There's so much aspiration out there. And once people get access to the internet, that aspiration will continue to go up. How do we possibly respond to this situation? Well, it gets right to the core of what we are as an institution. The World Bank uh, 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 group, at the time it was just one part of the World Bank group, was founded in 1944 out of the ashes of World War II. And in a... a, um, I think it's just a brilliant, um, uh, uh, what's the right word, in, 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 in a brilliant move, uh, leaders in the world, especially of the UK and the United States, said that before the war ended, we have to build institutions that on the one hand 
can bring stability. Because before World War II and during World War II, currency wars were happening. Uh, cu countries would devalue, uh, they, 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 they would devalue their currency, would try to do everything they could to gain an advantage, and the status of global currencies was in a mess. And so they needed to bring some stability to the global system. But also, they thought that there should be an organization that rebuilt Europe, and that's what the World Bank is. The international, the original name was the International Bank for Reconstruction and Development, and the purpose was to rebuild Europe. But then something happened right around that time, which was in 1946, which was announced in a commencement speech at Harvard in 1946 by General George Marshall called the Marshall Plan. The Marshall Plan then took over in terms of building uh, back Europe, and the World Bank had to find some other things to do. The first loan of the World Bank, though, was to France. But uh, since that time, the World Bank has shifted and then focused more on poverty. Um, the, the, the founding principles, uh, Secretary of Treasury Henry Morgenthau opened the conference, and he said that the goal of the World Bank group the, the, the goal of the meetings was to create a dynamic world economy, and I quote, a dynamic world economy in which the people of every nation will be able to realize their potentialities in peace, to raise their own standards of living and enjoy increasingly the fruits of material progress. For freedom of opportunity is the foundation for all other freedoms. Uh, he also argued that prosperity has no fixed limits. It's not a finite substance to be diminished by division. On the contrary, the more of it that other nations enjoy, the more each nation will have for itself. So this was a wonderful vision, and I don't think we've uh, moved too far away from that uh, uh, even uh, today. By the way, the other person that uh, put the conference together, in addition to Secretary of Treasury Henry Morgenthau, was the great John Maynard Keynes, probably the second most famous economist of all time behind Adam Smith. But he was uh, a very, very important uh, person, and that conference, which was not easy, led to the foundation of this organization. So what do we do? Well, over the past 70 years, uh, countries have paid in capital, have given us money. But we don't take that money and then just give it away. Uh, some of it we do uh, since 1962, but a total of $19 billion has been paid in to the World Bank Group, including the International Bank for Reconstruction and Development, and also uh, IFC, our private sector group. Now, with that $19 billion, we've made close to a trillion, over $900 billion in loans and grants. So what happens is that if you actually create a bank and give them capital, they use that capital, and then they can go to, we anyway, can go to capital markets and raise, uh, uh, raise financing. And we've been able to do that to the tune of $900 billion. In addition, we've been able to put $28 billion directly into an account that we reserve for the poorest countries. And this, this, uh, this, this, this uh, program is called IDA, the International uh, D Development Association. And IDA gives grants to the poorest countries. Uh, they can pay it back over 40 years. Right? Very hard to get a loan that you pay back over 40 years at 0% interest. And we do that to help countries grow. Now, that, that's what we've done over time. Uh, when I first walked into the World Bank, I saw this sign, our dream is a world free of poverty. And I asked, why is this a dream? Why don't we turn this into a real target and a goal? And we did. After three to four months of arguing, and that's what we do at the bank, we argue. We argue with data. We argue with, uh, uh, with politics and ideology. We, do, we argue with many different kinds of tools. We came to a conclusion. We wanted to end extreme poverty. That's people living under $1.90 a day by 2030. And we also were committed to boosting shared prosperity, reducing inequality. And we decided that there would be three ways for us to get there. The first, traditionally, we've always focused on economic growth. But in this case, we, we're, we're focusing on inclusive, meaning everyone benefits, sustainable, meaning that uh, it, it doesn't destroy the planet, inclusive, sustainable economic growth. The second, because there are so many crises that are affecting the world every day, pandemics, climate change, refugees, fragility, conflict, violence, uh, we wanted to, to focus on fostering resilience to those kinds of, uh, of, uh, of problems in the world that affect more and more people. And finally, uh, the third pillar was to invest more and more effectively in people. So inclusive, sustainable economic growth, resilience to the various shocks that are happening in the world today, and investing more and more effectively in people. Now, uh, we have had to change because the world has changed, and the world's changed pretty dramatically. In the 1960s, probably 70% of all capital flows, of all money going into developing countries, 
came from official development assistance of which we're a part. So in other words, the money that was going into the developing countries all came from, uh, uh, from the, the donor agencies, the US, USAID, those agencies like that, and groups like ours. But look at, look at over here how far it's dropped. Oh, cool. Uh, see that? So even in 1990, in 1990, 50% of all the capital flowing into developing countries was official development assistance. But starting in 1990, it dropped. And now it's been less than 10%. And so we used to be able to tell countries what to do, and they would listen to us because we were such a big player. But now all of official development assistance is only 9%. And so in that context, what do we do? How do we play a role? How can we uh, help uh, the, 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 the billions and billions of people in the world who are being born today or who are young, who are going to be looking for jobs, how do we help them uh, achieve their goals? The first thing that I told you about, resilience. So this is a woman living in a, in a refugee community. Uh, there, are, um, there are so many people now living in situations of, uh, of fragility. Uh, Two billion people in the world live in fragile and conflict-affected areas. And by 2030, 46, nearly half of all the people living in extreme poverty will live in fragile and conflict-affected states. We're doubling the work that we're doing in fragile and conflict-affected states. But we're also realizing that, uh, that uh, you know, we, we do about 60 to $65 billion worth of business every year. But we realize that 60 to 65 billion is nothing. It's a drop in the bucket. There's no way that we can solve any of these problems uh, the refugee crisis, pandemics, uh, famine, all these, we can't solve them with our capital. We have to find ways of leveraging others. So we have created, for example, uh, uh, after the horror of Ebola, uh, we were so worried about why did we wait so long to respond to Ebola that we created an insurance instrument. And so now for the first time in history, we have an insurance instrument that will release automatically when uh, diseases like Ebola get to a certain stage. It would have released much, much sooner uh, than, uh, than money actually moved to, to, to uh, Liberia, Sierra Leone, and Guinea during the Ebola crisis. And what we did was pretty straightforward. Instead of, pay, instead of putting a bunch of money aside or going to donors and asking for money, we went to the capital markets and said, is anyone interested in purchasing a bond, a three-year bond, capital at risk, meaning if there's, a, if there's an epidemic, you're going to lose all your money, but we'll pay you 8% a year. There are so many people who are so desperate to get 8% a year that we were oversubscribed, and now we have $450 million that's th that's, uh, that, that, that sits in our accounts, ready to be dispersed if there's a, if there's a pandemic. And we, we had to pay something for it, but a tiny fraction of the overall amount. We're now using that same principle, and we're, gonna, we're working on developing famine insurance. You know, it, the famines happen all the time. We're always late in responding, and we thought, why not create an insurance instrument that will respond right away so that we catch the, 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 uh, the famines earlier and, and, and literally snuff them out rather than letting them get worse and worse and worse. So we're doing this, and we're, we're trying to leverage everything we possibly can. We're now the largest financiers of climate change activities in the world. We're committed to this, uh, but again, we can't do it with our own financing. We have to leverage others. Um, this is really the biggest game. Uh, so the size of the global economy is about $78 trillion. There is about $7 trillion sitting in negative interest rate bonds. That means that you put your money in a bank, but rather than the bank giving you interest, you pay them every year to hold your money. So if you gave them $100, at the end of the year, you'd have $98 or $99 instead of $100. And the reason people do that is they're so scared of risk that they're willing to pay someone to hold their money because at least that's safe. There's another $10 trillion sitting in very low yielding government bonds. There's another $9 trillion in cash. Literally, people take 1,000 euro bills and put them in their safes. Now, uh, we feel that that is the kind of money we need to be able to give everyone in the world an opportunity. And why not? They're getting such a little return. We think we can help them get a higher return while at the same time uh, providing opportunities for everybody, and especially in the area of infrastructure. So the idea, uh, this is the Ghanaian Stock Exchange. And I don't, I don't know why I show you this, but it's just it's a cool picture. Ghanaian Stock Exchange. 
the, the notion now is that instead of seeing ourselves as a lender, seeing ourselves as direct in, 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 interveners, we see ourselves as facilitators. And the idea that we're now talking about to everybody is the idea of maximizing finance for development. How do we mobilize those trillions of dollars sitting on the sidelines for the benefit of the poorest people in the world? Uh, we, we know that the private sector has to be much more involved in development than before because there are many, many examples of win-win situations. Let me show you one. The Queen Ali International Airport. If you've ever been there, it's a wonderful airport. The Jordanian government came to us and said, we need a, to rebuild the airport, and we'd like a loan. And then uh, if you give us a loan, if you give a loan to the Jordanian government, then our people will run it. We said, you know, there may be a better way to do that. And so without taking a single penny of loan, without paying a single penny in terms of interest payments on loans, we were able to get the private sector to finance this completely. The Jordanian government, though, still owns 54% and therefore receives 54% of the, the profit. And without putting a penny into, the, into this airport, they have received over a billion dollars over the last nine years in revenue from the airport. They were about to go a very different direction, but uh, really wonderful staff on, on, uh, 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 at the World Bank said, why don't you try this another way? This is a great example of how we can change the way we do business and not only reduce the indebtedness of countries, but give them a return. Uh, this is, this is um, uh, the kind of investment that now a lot of people want to make. There's $5 trillion that's about to be inherited by millennials from their baby boomer parents. And what I'm hearing every day is that we don't want to just sit on this money. We want the money to have an impact in the world. So there is this phenomenon that's called impact investing. <laughs> Very important. What people are saying is, it's not just risk and return. What's the risk of the investment? What's the return? It's risk, return, and impact. And if the impact is high, we're willing to take more risk and get less return. Great idea, but it's tiny, relatively speaking. It's about $200 billion uh, a, a year now, which is very small compared to the needs. Uh, the need to achieve the Sustainable Development Goals, the UN, uh, um, the, 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 the UN Sustainable Development Goals, the Global Goals as they're called, is about $4 trillion a year. So all of official development assistance is about $140 billion. You throw impact investing on, on top, another $200 billion, still we're nowhere close to the $4 trillion that's needed for, um, uh, uh, to, to, to meet the de demands of impact investing. Here, what we've done is instead of saying take a lower return, instead of saying this is an issue of charity, we have put together a system where we go to African countries and we help them with all aspects of doing a solar auction. And so again, without our putting any money in, just helping them technically do it, we uh, have a program called Scaling Solar. And Scaling Solar now has gotten the, the latest was 4.7 cents a kilowatt hour in Senegal. So Senegal pays 15 to 20 cents a kilowatt hour for electricity, but the, the solar auction, because we helped them with it, now they're only going to pay 4.7 cents. This is a huge victory, and we're now going to take that elsewhere. Again, we didn't put any money in. We just helped structure uh, the, the, the deal, and in structuring the deal, uh, we got solar at a low price. But this is the crisis that I'm most concerned about, the human capital crisis. Um, 400 million people lack access to essential services. 100 million people fall into poverty every year from catastrophic health expenses. One third, only one third of the world's poor are covered by safety nets. All of you are covered by safety nets. The one third of the world's poor are not. Uh, the worst part of this problem, in my view, is childhood stunting. Childhood stunting is very straightforward. It's being, if you're two standard deviations below the height for age, and we know now that all children in the world can grow 25 centimeters in the first year, 12 centimeters in the second year. There's some variation, but, there, the, but, but every child in the world, if they're adequately nourished, can grow that much. So the numbers are just stunning. There are 38% um, yeah, of children in Ethiopia are stunted. And we know that stunted children don't learn as well and definitely don't earn as well when they get older. In, in, in other words, what happens to these stunted children is their brains are actually not formed. This is a study by a professor at Harvard uh, from Bangladesh. On the left is a stunted child, and the right is a, is a healthy child. And the gold is just the neural tracts. In other words, stunted children have fewer neural connections. And so uh, they're, 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 they're just simply not going to do as well. 
and the percentages are extraordinary. All of Sub-Saharan Africa averages about 30, 35%. India, 38%. Indonesia, 37%. Pakistan, 45%. So that proportion of the children uh, are likely not going to be able to compete in what will be a surely more digitally demanding economy of the future. Um, education, we also have huge problems. And uh, 250 million children cannot read or write. Uh, but in, in India, three quarters of third graders can't solve a two-digit two subtraction. Uh, by fifth grade, half of the students in India still could not. In Brazil, the 15 -year -old, skills of 15-year-olds that have improved, but at the current rate, they won't reach average wealthy country scores in math for 75 years. And in reading, it would take 263 years at current rates. 260 million children still not in school. And what's even worse is that even in countries where children are in school, what we found uh, through a, a, pro a project that we're running, and you know, I'd, we have some uh, American University grads from the World Bank here. Can, 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 where are you guys? You see, there's a future. And, uh, <laughs> and, and um, uh, we have now done uh, one of the most important uh, uh, learning outcome studies. It's called the Harmonized Learning Outcome Database. And we now know, um, uh, in, for any uh, given country, uh, how much learning that happened in the years that you were in school. So even if you were in school for 12 years in Yemen or Malawi, um, you're only going to get about half the benefit as uh, if you were in school in Singapore. So Singapore has a great school system. And if Singapore is the standard, then what we found, unfortunately, is that in many countries in the world, you lose almost five years of education. So the education system is not working. So what happens if you're stunted to begin with and your educational system uh, is not providing you what you need to compete in the economy of the future? Well, uh, I've been involved in global health and global education for most of my adult life. And one of the things I recognized was that we had been extremely successful in arguing for more funding for HIV, more funding for TB, more funding for malaria, and even more funding for education. But it created a situation where many heads of state and ministers of finance have become a bit complacent and are waiting for the grants to come. And they're kind of saying, well, if you give us the money to do that, we will. But if not, we have more important things to spend our money on. We have to spend our money on hard infrastructure. We have to spend our money on roads and electricity. And all that's true. But what we've also found is that human capital may be the most important investment they can make. This is from a study on, um, on, on uh, uh, the wealth of nations. We call it the changing wealth of nations. And for the first time, and Quentin, where's Quentin? Quentin Woden would, uh, uh, earned his PhD in economics here at American University, uh, uh, was a lead economist who brought human capital for the first time into the wealth of nations. And the human capital is the dark part, right? So that's human capital. And so high-income countries, middle-income countries, low-income countries, even in low-income countries, human capital is a significant proportion of uh, the overall uh, wealth of a, of a nation. And it's the first time we've ever included human capital. If you, though, look at human ca uh, capital at wealth per capita, first of all, you see that the high-income countries have so much more wealth per capita than the middle-income or low-income countries. But then look at the proportion of human capital, the dark, right? and see how far the low and middle income countries have to go to catch up in terms of their investments in human capital. So we made a decision. Um, I was, uh, you know, it worried me that so many countries were just waiting for the grants to come in. There was no urgency in investing in, uh, in, in, in people in their health and in their education. So we're gonna come up with a ranking. Now rankings are very controversial, but what we know about rankings is boy, do they get people's attention. So we're actually going to rank the countries, uh, the member countries of the World Bank, uh, World Bank Group. And uh, we're going to look at survival. We're going to look at uh, uh, quality-adjusted years of schooling. So it's not just the number of years you went in school. It, we're going to use the database that we're developing at the bank. And we're only going to give you credit for those years of school that you actually learned, the, the years of school to which you've actually uh, 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 learned. And if you look at two health indicators, adult survival and um, uh, uh, childhood stunting, you really can uh, bring into the equation the impact of health on um, uh, where you sit in terms of your overall human capital. So we're going to do a ranking. We're going to come up with a productivity number. I can talk more about it later if you're interested in the details of it. 
And we're going to announce this. We're going we're to publish this ranking in uh, October at our annual meeting. And it's going to be incredibly controversial. Some, there are many, many leaders who will be very angry at me, especially the countries that come out ranked below countries to which they've always felt superior. And yet, what we know from the doing business ranking is that unless you do a ranking, it doesn't get people's attention. We've done study after study after study showing that investing in health and education is important, <laughs> but those studies haven't led to the kind of response that we need. Uh, now, is it possible to do something? Absolutely. This is Peru. We found, uh, you know, Peru, I, I worked in Peru for years. And in Peru, for years and years and years, we tried to reduce childhood stunting, but it never happened. And then finally, in about 2007 or so, the World Bank took some money that it wasn't using elsewhere, put it into a national project on trying to reduce stunting, and in seven years, they reduced the stunting level in half. We, knew, we learned a lot of lessons from that, and the point that we're going to make to all our clients is we're not condemning you with this ranking. We're trying to get you to pay attention, and then we're going to do everything we can to help you move up the ranking, because in fact, if you don't, your people may not be able to compete in the economy of the future. Now, as I wind down here, oh my goodness, okay, we're gonna, we have more time afterwards. Um, I, 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 want to, um, I want to talk about, in the, in, the, in the context of the history, the history of development that I talked to you about, uh, I really do feel, especially with so much of the, of the um, uh, controversy that you see today, I really, I, I think that there has to be a new way of interacting with each other as human beings. You know, when I say that, that um, uh, 200 years ago, just about everyone was poor, 50 years ago, um, you know, uh, when I was a young person, 54 years ago when I was still living in Korea, there was a sense that countries like Korea, the poorest countries in the world, would always be poor. You know, this, the, the term poverty will, will always be with you. Uh, and so there was a huge amount of literature on how rich countries and organizations like the World Bank, how they should think about their mission with respect to poor people. And there was a huge amount of literature created. And when I, when I as an anthropology grad student, read those historical accounts of my country, of Korea, I just didn't recognize what they were writing about. And so I read a book um, in graduate school that was one of the most influential for me. Uh, it was a book called Orientalism by Edward Said. Does anyone know that book? Yeah. And, you know, I have to tell you, everywhere I go in the Middle East and even in Asia, people have read this book. Because here's what Edward Said said. Edward Said made the argument that when you read accounts of the Orient, and for him it meant the Middle East, um, uh, Persia, and, and, and uh, uh, you know, the, the countries of the Middle East, but it extends all the way out to Japan and East Asia. He said that when you read accounts of those countries, you're not really reading about those countries. You're reading about the authors, because the authors are using their accounts of those countries for other purposes than humble description. And he wrote this. There's a difference between knowledge of other peoples and other times that's a result of understanding, compassion, careful study, and analysis for their own sakes. And on the other hand, knowledge, if that is what it is, that's part of an overall campaign of self-affirmation, belligerency, and even outright war. Now, I, let me suggest to you, I feel like I'm back to being a professor, let me suggest to you that the anthropological mission of doing ethnography, of really trying to understand what the world looks like from the perspective of others, is just as important as all the technical things I've talked to you about. This is a change that fundamentally uh, we need to see. It all goes back to this. These kids want to have a chance to become whatever they want. And I think about, you know, this is me back in uh, 1963, <laughs> living in Korea. And this is what Korea looked like in 1963, one of the poorest countries in the world, lower GDP per capita than Ghana, than Somalia, than Kenya. And this is what the World Bank said. Korea is so poor, they're so backward, we're not going to give them a loan because they'd never be able to pay it back. Right? They were wrong about that, of course. But that's what they said. Last year, I was in Tanzania, and I was in this classroom. And um, I like to ask the children, so what do you want to be when you grow up? Two kids raised their hand and said, I want to be president of the World Bank. <laughs> Just like you, my own staff and the teachers laughed. But I said, in 19, I stopped them, and I said, in 1963, when then president of the World Bank, George David Woods, if he had visited Korea, and it's 
plausible that he would have visited Korea to see if they were, were eligible for, for loans then, if he had visited Korea and if he'd visited my uh, preschool, I doubt that he would see, he, I doubt that he would have thought that one of his successors was sitting in that room. So can we do this? Can we actually create equality of opportunity for everyone? I would argue that if we don't, we're in big trouble. About how many years ago? 55 years ago, President John F. Kennedy came to, the, to American University in June to give the commencement speech. And in that commencement speech, he said this, no problem of human destiny is beyond human beings. Man's reason and spirit have often solved the seemingly unsolvable, and we believe they can do it again. He was talking about the nuclear test ban treaty. But I think the task we have today is even bigger. Can we give everyone, every child on earth, an equal opportunity to become what they want? Hey, I had that. I truly believe that every child deserves it. And unless we use the tools of finance to do it, uh, we will not succeed. But it's going to be your problem. Because the thwarted ambitions of a young person in Africa, in the Middle East, is not going to be distant from you. That we know. The world is so interconnected that you're going to have to think about their prospects as well as your own. Thank you very much. <clears throat> busy on stage all of a sudden. Hi, everybody. I'll move, I'll move. Great. Hi, everybody. Hope you enjoyed the presentation by Mr. Kim. I'm Joshua Johnson. I'm the host of 1A from WAMU and NPR, and I'll be moderating our Q&A. Now that we have moved all the furniture around, we're going to take some time to take some of your questions about what you've heard, about what the World Bank is. By the way, by, by a show of hands, where are the high schoolers again? OK, you get first crack at questions. Absolutely, yeah. You get to go first. Undergrads, where are you? Grad students? Alumni? Alumni who've donated to AU? <laughs> you get second crack at the questions. See, I, I should have realized everyone's here because they want to see Joshua. You no, know? they're not. You've heard his voice on the radio, and now you want to see what he looks like. Huh? They're in high school. They have no idea what oh, a radio on, is, public radio. <laughs> let alone that there's a show on it. <laughs> We're going to take your questions in the time that we have. Uh, it is 4.45. We've got a little time to go over. Uh, we'll try and keep you not too much longer, maybe for about another half hour. Yeah. But I work in radio. Perfect. I can get a lot done in a half hour. Perfect. Uh, we do have two mics. If you would please, <clears throat> as you have ideas for questions, do line up at the mics. Introduce yourself, your name, what organization or school that you're with in your question. I have one rule for Q&A. Whenever I moderate, this is my one hard rule is to please be generous with our time. There are a lot of very bright people in this room, Mr. Kim included, and there's a lot that we can learn from one another if we make the best use of our collective time with one another. So the more generosity you can show in the way that you phrase your question, the more we can collectively learn from your experience and your insights, as well as the insights of the people next to you. That's my one rule, be generous with our time. Agreed? All right, by way of giving you time to line up at the mics, I want to ask you one or two questions, and then we'll start with questions. So don't be shy. If you have something you'd like to ask, feel free to line up. First of all, by show of hands, how many of you had never heard of the World Bank before you were told you were coming here today? Is everyone familiar, particularly the students, all familiar with the World Bank? All right, A students, clearly. Just wondering how much background we should give on the World Bank, but they know. They probably know more than I know. They should probably be up here moderating. You described a lot of the opportunities that stand before the World Bank and the way that you'd like to pursue them. What's the biggest thing standing in the way? If you could wave a wand right now and remove one impediment immediately, what would you remove? Well, you know, part of it is that, um, that there are so many, the, 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 the traditions that I told you about, colonialism, you know, missionaries, uh, the generosity of uh, the rich to the poor, uh, these ideas of what development about is are very deeply entrenched. So the notion that the World Bank Group would act as a facilitator of, thing, you know, of, of, of moving capital so that we can actually give everyone the opportunity to create jobs, create you know, small and medium enterprises, whatever, whatever and also um, uh, you know, get uh, 
uh, leaders to invest more in health and education so that everyone can take advantage of these opportunities, it goes against very um, old and, 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 and I think very sort of um, uh, deeply embedded views that this is about generosity or that this is about, uh, 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 about a civilizing mission. And uh, there's, there's nothing wrong with generosity. Generosity is wonderful. We need uh, the developed countries to be even more generous. Right? But I think we're playing a different game right now. When, you know, uh, 50 years ago, uh, when I was growing up in Korea, 55 years ago when I was growing up in Korea, almost nobody in Korea knew about how Americans lived. My parents were extremely fortunate. They got scholarships to come and study in the United States. And so their aspirations shot up because they could see the possibilities in front of them. Now everyone in the world will have that opportunity. So the game has changed. And I think we have to think about this very differently than sort of, well, you know, nice things will happen if we're generous. Generosity is important, but we have to create an environment where truly everybody has an opportunity. And that's going to require making the most out of the, uh, the, of the global system as it exists. You described how <coughs> technology is creating more awareness among particularly younger people around the world of the way that the rest of the world lives, this kind of historically relatively recent middle class. Absolutely, yeah. Can you clarify what you mean by the, the aspiration? I mean, I, I can see people wanting to have a better education, for example. But from what you see around the world, is it that people want to have a better education or they all want to be able to go to American University? Is it they, they want to have free access to information or do they want to watch on a 70-inch ultra 4K high def television? Like what, is it the material things? Is it the quality of life? Is it personal security? Like what is it exactly? Well, it's, it's very different in different places and it, and it depends on who you know, people's uh, idols are. So, um, you know, lots of children still all over the world want to become the next great, you know, soccer star, right? There's still that kind of stuff. But, you know, what I'm seeing is that people want a good education. People want uh, access to health care. People don't want to, uh, to, to uh, be plunged into poverty because they're paying for their mother's uh, health care out of their own pockets. Uh, they want a chance to ha have a job, and they, they definitely would love to have a chance to create jobs. But it's, it's not one thing everywhere. But I have to tell you, you know, I, I, who am I to tell people that they can't have high aspirations? I did. I mean, you know, this is, this is the world we live in now. And so uh, that's going to happen. That process is not one that we can stop, people having higher aspirations. Uh, the, the, and and, and I, I, I don't want to try to shape what they are. You know, they, they are what they are in different countries in different ways. What we have to do is to think about what would it take to create a system where uh, really the only limitation is your effort, the only limitation is um, uh, you, you know, your, um, uh, your willingness to work for those things. It doesn't exist today, and it will have to because the frustration coming from having the aspiration without the opportunity could lead many, many countries down the path to fragility, conflict, violence. We're seeing that in so many places in the world that the task is, uh, is just more urgent than you can know. I'll give you a little bit more time to line up at the mics and get ready to ask your questions. But I am curious. But I'm an old teacher. I can call on people too. So, right? Yeah. <laughs> That'd be very entertaining. I think I might enjoy that. I will get to your question in just one second, but I do wonder what you think about the mood around the world for doing this kind of work. There's a real populist wave that swept across much of the world. Some would argue that the U.S. plays a big role with that, with our current president, who has made no secret of his desire to focus on America first, to spend more money investing on problems here at home, some real, some which bear a little bit more evidentiary analysis. I wonder whether or not you think the mood around the world is ripe for this kind of work, or whether people who have your mentality need to adapt to that, maybe wait on some things, don't push too hard so you don't panic people who are feeling very populist. How do you view that? Well, you know, I, I think President Trump tapped into something very real. I mean, I, my, own, um, uh, my own classmates, I grew up in Iowa. I, you, you can all tell I grew up in Iowa, right? Uh, I grew up in Iowa, in the middle of everywhere. I was going to say right? Nebraska, man. Yeah, I know. <laughs> the accent's different. That's close. Yeah, right. yeah. So I grew up in Iowa, and, you know, I had a graduating class of 1,000 1, students. Um, uh, only 10% went to college. And of the 10% that went to college, 90% of the 10% went to community college. And my friends who I played football, basketball, whatever with, they said, I can't believe that you're paying to go to school more. 
right? I just got a job in the steel mill. I'm getting paid $20 an hour. I just bought my first house. I bought my truck. Why are you going to school longer, right? And so those guys are not very happy with the way the world looks right now. The steel mills have closed. And, you know, frankly, um, at their age, they're not going to learn how to code at this point, right? So there are many, many people that have been left out of uh, global processes. But the other thing is that they also uh, have a lot more cool stuff in their homes because they go to Walmart and buy stuff at a much lower price because of, uh, of uh, openness in trade, for example. So yes, there is a populist movement, but there's also an understanding uh, that if we don't pay attention uh, to poor countries, uh, the, the life that we know is going to change. And it's already happening in Europe. So that so, populism includes a lot of xenophobia in many absolutely, cases, too. Absolutely. And, and, you know, look, I'm an anthropologist, and I am who I am, and I'll have to tell you that I think xenophobia is a terrible uh, problem that we all have to get our heads around. Because, you know, uh, th th this is uh, uh, getting to a new way of understanding each other, getting to a new way of understanding uh, difference. This is going to be one of the most important skills that any human being can have to be successful. And so, uh, look, I, it, that's just my take. Right? So I, I will just tell you that that's where I come from. I can give you a lot of analysis of why xenophobia is, very, um, uh, is not a very good strategy to take out to the rest of the world. It just doesn't work well uh, because uh, the economies of the world are already so deeply integrated. Uh, but um, yeah, it exists. It's, it's out there. And it's coming from people who, who are less prepared to compete in the economy of the future. Let's get to some of your questions. We'll start with you. If you would please just introduce can, yourself. Can we, your let, name. can we let a high school student come to the front? Who's the first? Oh yeah, high is there a high student? school student in line? In line? Anybody in line? A high school first, student? Your high school student? Okay, we got a high school student. You, you if you, ma'am, you, he bumped you. I'm really, I, I have no control. Introduce yourself. Your name. What school do you go to? And then your question. All right, I'm Maxime. Rotsar. Grab the mic if you would please. Yes. There you go. All right, I'm Maxime Rotsar. I'm a student at Washington International School. Um, so my question today is, um, in the context of today's digitalizing world and the changing nature of employment, um, I'm a high school student and so I'm entering college considering what to study. Um, what would you tell us um, to learn in the future? What learning opportunities, learning ethic would you tell us high school students, but also um, grad students, people working already um, to seek out to remain effective citizens or contributing citizens in today's world? Great Before you answer, could yeah. I just ask you, do you sure. have any idea what kinds of things you want to study, or have you given this any thought for yourself? Um, BA, but... What is it? it? Tell me. What, what, Probably what economics. 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 <laughs> do, you want to, do you want to be an economist, or... You, do, you want to be an economist? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So. Good question. A, so, just a couple of things. So for, first of all, you know, you, you, uh, one of the things you have to think about is what are, what are the skills that will always be needed, no, no matter how technology changes the world. And skills like you know, being able to work with others, being determined, uh, you know, understanding how others think and feel around you. So some of these things that we call soft skills, we found at the World Bank Group that they're extremely important. So being able to work and play well with others. You know, after grade school in the United States, we stopped giving that grade, works and plays well with others, right? That's a mistake, I think. I mean, you know, that, that's a really important grade to continue to have. But here's what I would say. So I, I, I asked my son, who is a senior at uh, Sidwell, the same question. And he said, you know, I have no idea what jobs will be available. Because, and he's right. Because um, uh, uh, around, so 65%, so this is the data from the World Bank again, 65% of grade school children today will be doing jobs that don't exist today. Right? So I think you, should, you, you need to prepare yourself. I, I think it's really important to understand finance and economics. I think everyone should understand how money works because that is, as President Xi Jinping has said, it's the ocean we all swim in. I mean, the, the, you know, uh, uh, everyone knows that that's the ocean we all swim in, so learn something about that. I think you have to understand computers, not necessarily knowing how to code, but you have to understand how they work. Right? And I think it's really also important to get a broad liberal arts education so that you can really understand the tremendous diversity in the world today. Being able to deal with diversity, multiple languages, this is going to be more and more important with every passing day. At least that's what I tell my kids. Right? Yeah. Thank you.
Let's get to another question over here. Yes. Hi, I'm Natalie Hedden. I'm a senior at American University's School of Public Affairs. Um, my question for you is I'm unfamiliar with the process that is taken to qualify the number of quality school years that a student receives. And I was just curious if you could speak to how you calculate that, um, if that process is complicated, um, and what factors you consider. Thank you. It, it is complicated. But um, the good news is that there's a lot more testing that's being done now. Right? So there's, there are some uh, global tests like the PISA, the Program for International Student Assessment, that's being done in now more developing countries. But for example, India has a huge uh, national testing system. And so we take every single piece of data that we can, and then it, it, um, uh, it's analyzed uh, from the perspective of trying to get comparability. So that even if there's a test that's only done in a few countries, we try to get a sense of how comparable that is to the other tests. So it's a very, it's, it's, a, it's a complicated system. Uh, I don't know all the details of it. Do, does, Quentin, do you know? I mean, you know, we, you, we can, if, you, if you're really interested, we'd be very happy to give you more data uh, specifically about how that happens. But it's, it's, it's been so important. And, and, and the reason is because uh, for years, we've argued that education is related to economic growth for a country. And that was really only true for the, the most advanced economies, the richest countries, because all we were looking at is years of schooling. Right? And, and so if you, if, if you can add in quality adjusted years of schooling, we see now that quality adjusted, adjusted years of schooling is very, very highly correlated with economic growth. So then we can make the argument to heads of state and ministers of finance that we're not telling you to do to invest in health and education because it's the nice thing to do. We're telling you to do it because if you don't, your economies won't grow. And that gets people's attention. And that, that's the great insight of this uh, quality adjusted years of schooling. Yes. Uh, hi, my name is Ariane Freuk. I'm a PhD candidate in economics here at AU, and I'm also staff at the, at the IFC. So my question is a little bit self-centered because I do work in impact investing at I, the IFC. Um, for those who do not know, it's the idea that um, besides financial returns, we can also work towards the sustainable development goals by investing, and in particular with institutional investors. But Dr. Kim, how do you see the IFC spearheading that effort? How can we become a leader in impact investing and actually mobilize the funds to achieve the sustainable development goals? So um, I think that we can argue pretty convincingly that the returns are there. Right? But then I think the two areas that we have a lot of work to do is we have to, we have to be better at explaining to the world how much we understand about risk. I mean, you, you know, we, we understand so much more about risk. What I, when I go talk to the, to, the, to the guys who run the big private equity firms or the big hedge funds, they say, Africa's so risky. And I said, well, what part of Africa? What are you talking about Africa is so risky? You know, there's, there, are, there are parts of Africa. There are countries in Africa. There, there, there are regions in Africa. There are, there are regions within countries in Africa. And yet, they just paint with a broad brush. And it's because we haven't been good enough at, uh, at, at, at putting in front of investors how much we know about risk. So if we change risk uh, assessments. Also, impact, you know, it's like green bonds. Everybody, there's so many green bonds, but there's no definition of a green bond. So everything is green. And, and, <laughs> and I think that if we get much, much better, and you know Hans-Peter is working on this. I mean, I don't know if you're working with, with Hans-Peter. Yes, I am. Uh, I think that once we get AIM, this, this idea of, of, of assessing the impact of each of our, our, our projects, if we, if we can uh, be much, much better at assessing the impact, the actual impact of any investment, then I think we can draw more people in. But the, the, the risk part is much more important, in, in my view, than the impact part. Return we can probably show, but if we can get people to understand risk in a very different way, I think that's going to get the money flowing. Thank you. Yeah. Comes our next question. Hi, uh, my name is Valerie. I'm a dual degree student pursuing a master's in business administration and a master's in international peace and conflict resolution. My question is with respect to motivating the private sector. Um, what methods does the World Bank use to facilitate those? Is it mainly through public-private partnerships, or is there another method that you encourage? So public-private partnerships are part of it, right? Uh, you know, but for, for pandemic bonds, right? When we started saying, could we actually insure the poorest countries in the world? The, the 75 poorest countries in the world are now insured against pandemics. You think we could actually do that? We didn't know. The question was, if we, went to the, if we went to the capital markets, would anybody be interested in buying a three-year capital at risk bond um, uh, uh, to, to protect poor countries against pandemics? So it turned out 
that, um, uh, that it almost didn't matter what it was for. Right? The, that what mattered was, what's the risk of an event happening in any given year? And given that risk, what's the return? And it turned out that the, an, the annual risk had to be around 3.7%, which is what it was. And the, uh, the interest that we paid in any given year had to be 8.7%. So 3.7% risk, 8.7% interest, we had $450 million, right? So there, there are some really straightforward things about the way the world works, that if you get the risk and return right, and they know how to do the analysis, uh, the, it's almost as if they're amoral about it. They don't care as long as they get the return. So that's, that, you know, that, that's what we now know, I think, that partly we need to do. If we sit around waiting for people to come and say, I'm so moved by your mission, I'm willing to take more risk and get a lower return, ain't gonna happen. Right? But we think we can set up situations where they don't have to do that, and then we can move the money. Yeah. Yes, sir. Okay, my name is Ambolai Mame. I'm from Liberia. I'm studying at the School of International Service, American University. So I, I listened to you when you spoke about the approaches you're using to address the issue of poverty, and I'm interested in the one that has to do with resilience. So when you talk about resilience, what runs through my mind is preparing societies and communities to adapt to poverty rather than solving and addressing poverty. So I, will, I want you to no. explain further what you mean by resilience. Oh, okay. So, so, in, in, so it, let's take Liberia as an example. Okay? You remember when the Ebola uh, epidemic hit in, in Liberia, and, and I, I did visit Liberia during the Ebola epidemic. Uh, Liberia did not have resilience uh, to an outbreak of Ebola uh, in 2014. And so the way we are building that kind of resilience into Liberia is Liberia is part of the pandemic bond. And now, if, we're, if we think that Ebola it has crossed over uh, from, uh, from uh, Guinea into Liberia, immediately the bond would release uh, uh, as much money as needed to stop the outbreak. Right? So it's not, it's not saying, you know, you're, you know, be resilient to your poverty. That's not what we're saying. It's helping poor people be resilient to all these things that are happening uh, to them in many ways, uh, quite out of their control. Things like climate change, things like um, uh, uh, pandemics, and even things like, you know, fragility, conflict, violence, and, and, uh, and, and refugees. So that's what we mean by it. And, and what we're trying to do is to use financial instruments to create this greater resilience. You know, uh, wealthy people uh, share their risk with capital markets every day. We have insurance for our homes. And this is all, what, what, what it is essentially is you're saying, I will pay you a little bit every year, and if my house burns down, you will pay me a lot of money. So in other words, you're sharing your risk with the capital markets. Poor people in poor countries almost never share the risk with capital markets. In this case, Liberians are now sharing their risk of, uh, of, uh, of Ebola with the capital markets, which is a good thing in, 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 in my view. Right. Yeah. Yes, sir. Hi, uh, Dr. Kim. My name is Dominic Delucia. I'm uh, a sophomore at American University, and I'm also the founder and chief editor of the Daily Blip, the Daily Bit, sorry, which is a, uh, a daily uh, blockchain slash cryptocurrency newsletter. And I was just wondering about blockchain technology and the, the World Bank's perspective. Do they see that as a possible solution to many of the problems that you stated? Yeah, absolutely. We, we see it as a potential solution. And um, you know, distributed ledger could be really helpful in fighting corruption. It could be really helpful uh, you know, uh, in, in just accounting for where money flows. Um, there's a tremendous potential to it, but uh, we're not investing in Bitcoin right now. I mean, we're not, we're, we, we, we still think the, the market is very, very young, right? And it, was, it is true that a lot of the cryptocurrencies were, in fact, Ponzi schemes, right? So it's, it's, not, it's not all of them. I'm not, I'm not you know, I said it once a year ago, and now that, that's the only quote ever, I ever see <laughs> coming from me. It is true, but it also is true that distributed ledger technology has huge potential. And we're act, we have, actually have an active group inside the World Bank group uh, working with all the other uh, development banks to try to figure out what, that, what the best uh, uh, application of it might be. If I could follow up on this question, do you think we should be preparing for the day when there is one currency to rule them all, Bitcoin or something else? I, Jack Dorsey, I believe, recently said that he thought Bitcoin was going to be the world's currency in 10 years. I'm not sure if that's going to happen, but do you think that's the way things are going? I, I you know, uh, of, of the things that I've heard, 
and, and I meet with the ministers of finance and, uh, and uh, the uh, central bank governors of the 20 largest companies, so-called G20. We meet like six times a year. I see them all the time. And I've never heard anyone talk about that. I mean, the, you know, national currencies and in the, in, in the euro, the dollar, they, they have a strategic value in addition to just being the way to exchange money. So it, it would be very interesting if all the other, you know, all the nation states, all the blocks like the, euro, the, the European <laughs> Union, all of a sudden, um, or the euro area just gave up their currencies for crypto. It, it would, I, I can't quite see that happening. Let's get to the thank, next question. Thank you for speaking with us. My name is Alice Browning, and I'm a student here at the Washington College of Law. Alice, come a little closer to your oh, mic, if you will, please. Sorry. Perfect. Yes. And my question has to do with um, empowerment. I think it's great that you're doing a measure of human capital, but it's also about self-perception. And I was wondering, because you touched on it a little bit with uh, the paternalistic attitude of colonialism, what strategies does the World Bank employ when it comes to economic empowerment to truly empower people rather than teach them? Yeah, you know, um, uh, there, there, are, there are lots of very specific fo um, ways that we do that. So for example, um, 25 years ago, uh, civil society could hardly get in the door uh, of a World Bank annual uh, uh, meeting. But now I meet with them <laughs> every year and they're very involved. And in fact, we now uh, have a lot of programs where civil society uh, helps to monitor the progress of, of specific programs. So, um, you know, empowering civil society, and you know, this is a difficult thing for us because, you know, we are a, a um, cooperative of governments, and there, there are different attitudes towards civil society in different governments. So for us to do this was, was both difficult but, but important. We, it, we focus um, tremendously on ensuring that women can participate in all the different projects. We have, very, we have uh, specific efforts to, for example, increase financing uh, for women entrepreneurs. So um, we, try to f we, we try to focus on especially vulnerable populations and, and, uh, and, and make sure that the vulnerable populations are also included. But I mean, you know, uh, next week at our spring meetings, every year we do a session on gender-based violence. Um, one, of our, um, one of our employees, uh, our staff, a great staff person at IFC, uh, lost a daughter, Heather Graham, University of Virginia. And so we, every year, we provide uh, hundreds of thousands, $700,000 a year to organizations all over the world who are thinking of ways of combating gender-based violence. And we're doing it in honor of, uh, of Heather, who was, who was killed and raped at the University of Virginia some years ago. So we, we do things that we haven't done before um, uh, because you know, it, it used to be the major focus was lending to governments for big-scale projects. We still do that because it's important. But we've also expanded tremendously in thinking about specific, especially marginalized populations. Mm -hmm. Sir? Thank you. First of all, thank you so much for speaking to us. My name is Christian Maish, and I'm a faculty member here at American University. Uh, you mentioned that the World Bank has helped Peru reduce by half it, uh, the standard growth among children. And I was wondering if you could please elaborate what are some of the specific policies, uh, programs, and projects that the bank has foster in Peru to achieve such a successful outcome. Yeah. So in, in Peru specifically, the most important part was it was a whole of government approach. Right? And in fact, it was interesting. Um, uh, we, we'd taken the money from another country that had stopped borrowing. And, and the leadership in Peru, the president, wasn't interested in the project. But there was so much interest among uh, the, the, the healthcare system, um, you know, the educational system, that we were able to inst institute a whole of government approach. And, and uh, the, the different community-based organizations uh, had different kinds of interventions. But um, uh, the fact that there was a community-based health worker system in Peru made a big difference. But it was bringing all the different ways that, that uh, programs in other parts of the world had succeeded in reducing uh, stunting, made them available to all the, 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 the different um, actors, you know, the, you know, the, the health clinics, the schools, making sure that they all had um, access to what the interventions uh, that worked in the world were. And then over a very you know, short period of time, the, the stunting levels dropped. And so the interesting thing is now the Peruvians are all over the world. They went to Indonesia, to Pakistan, they're going to Africa. The Peruvians had such a great experience now that we're, we're promoting this so-called so South-South interaction. And so the, the, the Peruvians are now teaching everybody how to, how to, how to reduce their stunting rates. I mean, it's important because... This is like an emergency. This is, you know, and it can be reduced very quickly, uh, but it's been hard for me to get the attention 
of heads of state and ministers of finance, the people who really make the money decisions. I think this ranking will get their attention. Wonderful. Yeah. Thank you. See how many more questions we can squeeze in before yeah. our time is up. Yes. Go ahead. Oh, lucky one. Okay. Hi. Thank you so much for coming. My name is Rachel King. I'm pursuing a master's in international development at the School of International Service. I am interested, however, in pursuing a career in the Foreign Service. And so my question to you is, what are the intersections between diplomacy and development? Some of the challenges that are faced uh, development-wise from a diplomatic standpoint and vice versa. That's my question, and then I would be very curious also to know what book you're reading these days on the airplane. <laughs> Thank you. Let's do the second question first. What yeah. are you reading these days? You, you know, um, uh, uh, I'm, I'm reading, well, I, let me just be honest. On airplanes, I mostly watch movies, right? <laughs> oh. And, and, uh, and I even watch television shows, right? Uh, so my, I have a nine-year-old son, and he loves the Marvel comics. And so I have watched, like, Flash. And so, so there's, because um, I, I have to deal with so many complicated issues that, un, that unfortunately, I'm not doing a lot, a lot of uh, that kind of reading. But, but um, uh, uh, let me, let me uh, um, well, I, I'm reading a lot these days about the history of, uh, of economic development. Um, so there's this book uh, uh, called uh, the, the, uh, the Great Convergence, and it's where um, a former World Bank uh, economist talks about how you know, that, that development is now converging, and, and he talks about aspirations, he talks about everything's coming together, and we're gonna need a different kind of mindset, a different kind of set of systems in the world as the world tries to converge, because we've never had that before. And that's why I talked about what was the world, the world looked like 200 years ago. So that, I'm trying to get my own head around how are we gonna deal with the exploding aspirations of people all over the world. All right, so in terms of the relationship, you know, I, you know the Secretary of Defense, Jim Mattis, put it pretty, in a pretty interesting way. He said, if you spend less money on, uh, on aid, I have to buy more bullets. Okay? So I, I think the relationship between diplomacy and, um, and, and development is intimate. And there's a reason why US, US Agency for International Development sits inside the State Department, right? The, the, our, our Ministry of Foreign Affairs. So I, I think it's critically important. I think that, um, you, you know, uh, I've watched over the last uh, five to 10 years how China and Japan both are moving so quickly into Africa, into Latin America, into South Asia, and they're providing uh, direct assistance, they're making investments, and they see this as part of their um, you know, overall nation building, right? And, and they are competing with each other in some ways, in, 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 some, in, in ways that are sometimes very, very productive, because the competition with each other makes that you know, we have even more uh, interest in development. So I, I, I think it's critically important, and I think it'll get more important over time. I should note, there will be a reception after this where we'll have a little more time to chat. But in the interest of time, and I'm sorry to everyone who's been waiting patiently in line, I think if we could get one more from this side and one more from that side, and then hopefully we'll have more time to sure. talk with you one-on-one -on -one sure. at the reception. Yes, ma'am. My name is Bianca Perger, and I'm a politics policy and law scholar at American University. Um, you talk a little bit about investing in Africa and the risk of it in places like Togo and Benin and Senegal. Um, and actually, there's been a new scramble for Africa where export-import banks across the globe have been tracking various like loans and um, credits that have been transferred to African countries for development finance. So I'm just wondering, in the interests of you know, the World Bank and export-import banks, how would you see, to what extent do you see export-import banks being helpful um, in development finance and working with the World Bank. Yeah. So I, I think you know, one of the things you're getting at is that the indebtedness of, uh, of low-income countries in Africa has gone up. I mean, they're, they're, the, uh, the number of countries that, uh, that we're now watching carefully uh, in terms of debt-to-GDP ratio has doubled over the last few years. So it's a real issue. And it's also one of the issues is the transparency of their indebtedness. Who are they getting money from? What, it's, what's the interest rate? What's the term? What's the maturity? And so we need to work at, at, um, at, at getting more transparency in, in the system so we have a much better idea of just how indebted um, these countries are. But I think export-import banks, I think they, they play an extremely important role. Now, um, uh, you know, uh, the, the, as aspirations grow, the demand for capital to build infrastructure, the demand for um, uh, 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 capital 
to invest in other kinds of uh, uh, development areas. This, this is only going to grow. So you know, one of the things that the US did is that now they're now putting all the different uh, development institutions together. And I think it's, I think it's a good thing. Uh, and they've also increased the um, flexibility of this new development organization so that it's not just loans or it's not just grants. They can actually take equity positions. And that's part of the problem. The reason, the reason that uh, the ability to take equity positions is so important is that if a, if a, a bank like OPIC, for example, um, in the United States, could take an equity position in an infrastructure project, that in and of itself reduces the risk of that uh, project. And there's one of the things that we need much, much more of in developing countries is that, is risk capital. People who are willing to say, I'm going to take an equity position. I'm going to sit here on this. I'm going to make sure that it succeeds. Uh, that's what a lot of countries need. So I, I, I think they're important. But there is also the danger that if we just go crazy and don't watch things like debt to GDP ratio, the ability uh, for countries to pay back these loans, then they could get in trouble again. Before we get to the last question, Thank can you. I just follow on the point sure. you just made? Do you think that more banks like OPEC don't do that kind of equity investing because they're afraid to, because they haven't thought just to a rule. do so? In the US, it they're was not just allowed. a rule. They weren't allowed, and, and now they're going to be allowed. Yeah. Yeah. Last question. Uh, hi, my name is Lucas Partridge. I'm a junior at Wilson High School. A little closer to the mic. Sorry. Uh, and over the past several decades, there have been several countries that have gone from being relatively poor to incredibly wealthy. And my question is, what are what is the indication, or is there a way to predict which country will become successful and incredibly wealthy? So, so which which country are you think which countries are you thinking of that went were incredibly poor and then became incredibly wealthy? Well, I think you give a really good example of South Korea. Uh, there are countries in the Middle East, like the UAE, also that uh, became very wealthy because they had oil, and obviously that's sort of like a windfall. They just happened to be in that location. Yeah. But I'm wondering if there are any other indications of which country will be the next big thing, which country will be the next incredibly con uh, successful country. It, it, it's a it's a great and brilliant question, and here here's the. Here's the problem that we see, right? So um, I had this amazing experience. The first time I visited Ethiopia, um, I was campaigning for this job in 2012. And I met with uh, um, the great uh, Prime Minister Mellis, uh, who passed away uh, soon after I met with him. But uh, I walked in the door, and he said, you know, Ethiopia is going to follow the Korean path. Do you know what Semaul Undong is? Right? And Semaul Undong is a Korean word for the new community movement. Right? And I had studied this for my PhD, so I knew all about it. And I thought, how on earth do you know what Semaul Undong is? He said, because he had his whole cabinet read in detail, knowing the Korean words about the Korean economic uh, development path. And I was very impressed that he knew about the Korean economic development path. But what worried me was, well, is that path going to be actually open to Ethiopia? Right? So Korea started off, you know, they started off um, uh, with just agriculture, the Republic of Korea. And, and the first thing, my, my aunts and uncles came to the United States selling human hair wigs, right? That was the first, one of the first exports. Uh, you know, Korean women cut their hair and sent it, and they sold um, human hair wigs uh, in, uh, in many cities in the United States. Then they went to black and white televisions. But they went through the sort of standard process of agriculture, light manufacturing, and then they started making ships and then they went into semiconductors. They went through all these stages of economic development. And the question is, is that path still open to Ethiopia? Right? So um, uh, you know, the, the, the Bangladesh is uh, probably the most efficient, lowest cost manufacturer of garments and shoes in their garment industry. Right? But the owners of the Bangladeshi garment factories are purchasing robots. They're called SOBOTS, S-E-W-B-O-T-S. Right? They're purchasing them from Germany, and the number of new jobs in the garment industry has dropped precipitously in Bangladesh. So if, if uh, um, you know, and the idea was that the, the garment industry went from China to uh, you know, Bangladesh and then to Africa. It, I don't think it's going to go to Africa. Right? And uh, if, if uh, robots are going to do lots of the heavy manufacturing, then heavy manufacturing is not going to become uh, an industry where you need cheap labor. It's going to be an industry where you need a lot of capital and a lot of technology, meaning that a lot of it will go back <coughs> to the developed countries. So I worry. I, I, you know, so, so what, we're not, what we're saying now is what, we don't know exactly which country will, you know, will, will develop. We don't know exactly uh, which country is going to be the next South Korea. But there are some things that you can invest in that you know will be useful. Right? So one of them is human capital. We know that no matter what happens, 
if you invest in the health and education of your children, you're going to have a brighter future. Right? One last story. So about 25, 30 years ago, we had, an, we had a debate within the World Bank Group about whether we should invest in telephone poles in India. Right? Because the idea was, you know, I remember hearing, well, you know, it's going to take 274 years for all Indians to have access to a phone. Wrong, right? <laughs> but we almost went down the path of investing in telephone poles. So the question I ask every day is, are we doing the equivalent of investing in telephone poles in India today because we're not thinking ahead enough? That's why we're so focused on human capital. Because, boy, human capital, you know, for sure. You know, solar-based electricity, probably pretty good, right? Uh, but uh, uh, else, uh, uh, otherwise, we, we're not sure. And so what we need to try to do is to create a, a cadre of young people who can think and learn and adapt to whatever happens and that they will be the ones who define which country succeeds in the future. Thank you. Very good question. Good questions all. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Jim Young Kim. Thank you, sir. Thanks so much. Thank much. Thank we'll see you at the reception. Thanks, everybody.